Welcome back to the show, everybody. Check out these headlines we have for you. The IMF, the DOJ, it's all based around crypto. Ashish Birla's in the news. Jeremy Allaire from Circle. We got the SEC looking for more fuel for their budget to kill crypto. We got the insider that reveals the government was moving to kill crypto. Bailout, systemic risk, FSOC, Jay Clayton. Legacy firms are moving in, and the FDIC transfers all assets to a new bridge bank? Somebody roll that beautiful intro. Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show, everybody. You can follow us on TikTok, YouTube, and Twitter for exclusive content. Right now, $1.13 trillion market cap for cryptocurrency, which is up 7.7% right now. 24,800 plus for Bitcoin, 1690 and change for Ethereum. Tether market cap is 73.2 billion, billion plus, I should say. XRP is 37 cents. We're up 2.4% on the 24-hour. Ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't gotten your ticket, it's 52-day countdown. 12 hours, 4 minutes, and 20 seconds and counting. I tell you what, this event is absolutely going to sell out. That is not me just pumping this thing. I'm telling you right now, this event's going to sell out. There's not a ton of tickets left. Uh, Jack McDonald, CEO of PolySign. Nancy Beaton, Uphold Chief Revenue Officer. Joe Endoso, CEO of Link2. And Otto Nino, Sologenic, Eleanor Tarrant, journalist Fox. We know John Deaton, the founder of Crypto Law, representing 75 plus thousand XRP holders, and at this point, the entire crypto retail investor space, to be perfectly honest. And we're even going to have this guy, Jeremy Hogan from Legal Briefs, is going to make a virtual appearance with us. Going to be an incredible day. Daniel from Casino Coin, CEO from Glint, Jay, uh, for, Jay from Spend a Bits, Clinton Donnelly. I'm telling you, the list goes on and on right here. Mika Canfield from Chief Marketing Officer from Flair Naming Services, which will be making a huge announcement on the day about what they're doing with Flair Networks. Coin, uh, Quincy Jones, XRP XTC developer, is going to speak, and you're not going to want to miss it. And so, so many others, ladies and gentlemen. This is going to be one heck of a day. Make sure you get your tickets to the event. Link underneath the video. Jim Cramer urges investors to sell their Bitcoin. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, I think we all know what comes next. I think Jim Cramer is really predicting a Bitcoin bull run. I mean, if you just do the opposite, there's the, what is it, the inverse Jim Cramer fund where they track everything that he says to do. And if you do the opposite, it's like skyrocketing right now. It's unbelievable, not financial advice. But I tell you what, this guy is obviously working for the powers that be in Wall Street and using the masses so Wall Street can have exit liquidity. That's what's going on there. U.S. Department of Justice files an appeal to block Binance acquisition of Voyager. Now, I'm just highlighting this because we know that there is a huge movement right now to really, really log jam crypto. And I think to reset it inside a regulatory framework is what's coming here. Now, you guys know that IMF uses the opportunity to grandstand on the fact that there was a bank run. They tie it into crypto. I think we all understand that we've been following this closely, that it is not because because of crypto that this happened, right? It was because of fractional lending. And to be perfectly honest, to go one step further, Moody's decided to uh, uh, downgrade the instruments that they were holding, right? And then that ended up putting them upside down because they fractional lend. So it's really a two-part problem here, but nevertheless, didn't stop, the, didn't stop the IMF warning the G20 about the widespread dangers of crypto. We don't need to read it. We get it. Right here is Ashish Birla sits on the board at Ripple. It says, my quote's in Reuters this morning. The government did the right thing. And then he says here, if we go into this, tech investor Ashish Birla had spent the last three days working nonstop between advising companies about how to make payroll, urging people to call their local politician. He's very happy with the federal government's decision to backstop deposits, but not make the bank's equity holders whole, he said. Companies should never have to worry about whether or not their deposits are safe. That's exactly right. No doubt about it. 
And here he says also, uh, Berler predicts that in the next few days, startups will rush en masse to open accounts at large banks. And he's absolutely right. We're going to see evidence of that in just a second before we get out of here. And for companies that hold considerable cash position, he thinks that there will be a surge of interest in hiring treasurers who will work to minimize the amount of cash companies are holding at the moment. And boy, I tell you, before we get out of here, you're going to find out just how right he is. Uh, Jeremy Allaire brings this to the ground level here. He says, a window into the past several days at the core macro risk. Now, I'm not going to play this whole thing, and it's all worth watching, by the way. But I want you to hear the first minute 30 because he really puts it where it needs to be. From the perspective of Circle that issues and maintains a USDC, which is a digital dollar stablecoin. 3.3 billion was fully available uh, to customers after U.S. regulators had stepped in. Uh, what would have happened if there was no intervention? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, first, we obviously made a commitment that using our own corporate balance sheet as well as external capital if needed, that uh, we would fully backstop that. Obviously, there was a lot of discussion about, you know, uh, what's that recovery look like? Is it immediately available? Over what period of time? And so um, we were very confident in our ability to do that, which is great. Uh, fortunately, we didn't need to do that. Um, we took a lot of precautions uh, late last week, uh, you know, really starting Thursday, uh, as we started to see a lot of things unfold. Uh, and you know, we, uh, you know, we've moved you know, all of our reserve assets to Bank of New York Mellon, which is an extraordinary custodian as well as, you know, held in the Circle Reserve Fund, which is short-term T-bills uh, managed by BlackRock. And so we're really trying to make sure that we've got the most solid infrastructure possible uh, for this digital dollar. Um, and and as, as I expect we'll talk about, uh, you know, it's, it's somewhat ironic that, you know, there's been a lot of talk about protecting the banking system from crypto. Here we have a situation where we're trying to protect a digital dollar from the banking system huh. uh, and the, the limitations of fractional reserve banking, the embedded risk uh, that that creates. And we've been advocating for a full reserve model for digital currency for some time at, a, at, at both, a, both an operational and a regulatory level. Yeah, well, certainly. Uh, absolutely. And there's the point, right? They're going after the fractional reserve lending there. But, you know, Congress and the regulators are blaming it all on crypto. When we know really it was the downgrading of Moody's from Moody's that really set all of this into motion so they could come in and sweep these banks up and take control here, right? That's what happened. Eleanor Terrence shared this at the SEC budget proposal. Gary Gensler emphasizes the agency's intention to ramp up crypto enforcement. And you can know that he's using every bit of what went on here this past weekend to his advantage. More money means more hiring. And the SEC has already said it plans to add extra staff to its digital enforcement squad, which is nearly doubled in size in a year. He goes on inside of this to ask for those funds and talk about the highly uh, speculative asset class. But here's where we need to be. <laughs> this is from Nick Carter. And, you know, when you hear, and it, look, it, it doesn't, look, we are, I am a highly speculative investor in this space. In a lot of different arenas, to be honest. But then there's moments like this that say, you know what? A lot of times my speculation, my conspiracy theories just happen to be spot on. Nick Carter shares this. It says, Dear God, Barney Frank openly admits that Signature was arbitrarily shuttered despite no insolvency because regulators wanted to kill off the last major pro-crypto bank. Colossal scandal. Eleanor Terrace shares Signature Bank board member Barney Frank says the bank closure was political. And this is the quote. I think part of what happened was that the regulators wanted to send a very strong anti-crypto message. We became the poster boy because there was no insolvency based on the fundamentals. Then there's this. We know that the FDIC and the Fed boards both voted unanimously for systemic risk exemptions. Both the FDIC and the Fed board, say it with me, voted unanimously for systemic risk exemptions for both Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, which had no insolvency at the time, according to Barney Frank. 
<laughs> so that depositors would get all their money back per sources familiar with the matter. Well, now, listen. Who does these things? The Financial Stability Oversight Council. Well, they said that the FDIC and that the Fed Board of Governors did that. You're right. That's exactly what they said. And I'm going to tell you right now, you know, this is what we're talking about, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking about the idea of systemic risk. That's what we're talking about. FSOC, right? Who sits on FSOC? Let's see. Mm, mm, the, chair, the Federal Reserve sits on FSOC. Who else sits on FSOC? Does the FDIC? They sure do. The FDIC sits on FSOC too. This is your 10 voting members right here that make up that panel, and two of them use their authority over the weekend to do exactly what we've been talking about for years. Just saying. And believe it or not, of all people, Andrew Sorkin actually asked Jay Clayton if we really just watch the entire banking system be nationalized. <laughs> Jay, but let me ask you this. You know, uh, you were a Republican member of the Trump administration. Um, I assume uh, you are uh, against, broadly speaking, big government. This is big government. In fact, I could argue to you that today all of the banking business has just been uh, de facto nationalized if, in fact, we are going to be guaranteeing deposits across the board. What do you think of that? Look, Andrew, big government, small government. Government is is an immense part of all of our lives. OK, so like it, it really is about smart government. I mean, what is, go is government 18, 20 percent of the economy? Um, our financial system is one of the most highly regulated um, businesses, industries in the world. Gover government is in the financial business every day. Now, on the post, look, what was done this weekend was what needed to be done in the moment. And when you're acting in the moment, you need to act broadly and powerfully. Is there a time, as, as both Rogers that you've had on uh, said so well, is there a time now where we have to recalibrate? Um, do we raise the FDIC insurance limit, but not make it unlimited? Um, things like that definitely ask questions. Um, but it's really about government calibration. Right. And, and look, post-2008, let me make this point. Post-2008, we were really worried about asset quality, stress tests around asset quality. Let's all, let's all recognize that duration risk was something that was on the back burner until we had this rapid rise in rates. Um, and now we're all going to deal with it. And, and you know... <laughs> He acknowledges this entire scenario really with the Moody's rating without saying it that way, right? But then calls on it like, oh, this is an area that we didn't focus on the way we focused on other areas in 2008 and that collapse. I tell you, you know, this is a wicked, wicked world we live in, ladies and gentlemen. And this right here from Stephanie Starr. FDIC transfers all assets to a new bridge bank concerning Silicon Valley Bank. Words mean things. You damn right they do. Shout out to DAI for that. What? What? FDIC transfers all assets to a new bridge bank. Have, now, understanding the systemic risk that we've highlighted here, understanding that the FDIC voted unanimously for systemic risk and exemptions, what, where is this? Where is this new bridge bank? Does it have a name? Anyone? What we do know in the interim is that the giant legacy firms that have been getting crushed for the last more than a decade, like JP Morgan Chase, Citigroup, are trying to handle the largest movement of deposits in over a decade since crypto started. And now all the money is racing to come to their houses. With a little help from the government, I might add. Not financial advice from me or anyone else. It's just my digital perspectives.